Good afternoon. It's nice to see you smiling. <laughs> right? Uh, let me first of all uh, say a couple of things. First of all, thank you last Wednesday. I know I wasn't here, but uh, I understand everything went very well, the day of prayer and fasting. And uh, we need to continue to pray and fast. Now, you may have been informed we were supposed actually to make a presentation to the Land Commission. Uh, the Land Commission was, is not yet back from Western Uganda. And so they told us that they will call again. Uh, and they will call us again and will probably be in March when we shall make the presentation. But I want to thank you for your prayers and let's continue to pray. Uh, their investigators are already on the ground. They came yesterday. And uh, they are doing investigation. We've given, furnished them with the documents that they need uh, to be able to look and see some uh, about, you know, consider our ownership of the property in Intao. Secondly, I want to bring greetings from South Africa from a number of people uh, that were there. I cannot mention each and every one, but uh, there are some people there who have been here and. Uh, they did send their love and their greetings to you. So I think it's appropriate that I make sure I deliver what they sent. Uh, thirdly, during my time of absence, we also lost a man, I think, whose faith and whose preaching has influenced so many. Uh, the younger generation may not know as much, but you can actually access some of his preaching uh, on YouTube, Billy Graham, and uh, the work that he did. I heard him once myself in Nairobi, 1976, and uh, definitely he has left a very good impact as a preacher. He's a man who lived through his ministry without scandal and with a good integrity, with a good, with a good name, and very exemplary indeed in spite of the very high status. I think the funeral will be happening this Friday, and so let's continue to be mindful of his family. Uh, we did have his son visit here, was it 2016? Yeah, his grandson, I beg your pardon, his grandson visited here and preached, in fact, in the field right here. So let's keep them in prayer as they go through this time. But we thank God for a long and very fruitful life. Tomorrow is fasting day again, isn't it? I was given a topic to share with you, and the topic is bearing the fruit of repentance. And I think it's appropriate, especially in this time of Lent. So please allow me to pray as we open God's word and seek to hear his voice and what he has to say to us. Father, thank you so much for this afternoon. We may not realize how privileged, how special it is for us to meet as we do in the middle of the day, to worship together as your people. And so we thank you because you want to meet with us, but you also want to speak to us. I ask, dear Father, that you'll open my mind to understand what you'll say to your people. Let my heart be filled with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that he himself will share with your people the word, speak to me, that you may speak through me, and help me to decrease, that only you will increase. Lord, we want also to be mindful of people like uh, the, Gra the Billy Graham family, extended family, as they go through this time of grief. Lord, that your comfort and the hope for which he lived will continue to give them strength through this difficult time. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Speak to us. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So bearing the fruit of repentance. You know, yesterday, I actually was talking to someone. And uh, we had had a situation between us. A situation of tension between us. Nothing major but something stood between us. And so for me, it was very special talking over this issue and clearing it up. 
You see, I grew up in a context of the East African revival where we understand that repentance is followed by putting right in situations where you've done something wrong to someone. And that's what we were doing today. I mean yesterday. And I thank God for that. Because sometimes we think that repentance just stops with us when we talk to God. But then there are other people who have been hurt. There are other people that need to hear your voice and know that forgiveness is flowing between the two of you. So this topic is very interesting. And you know, when we set up that time, I was not even thinking of this topic to meet with this person. But it's a very appropriate topic to talk about bearing the fruit of repentance. And we are going to be talking about it coming out of the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, which was read for us. The church at Thessalonica was established by St. Paul together with Silvanus and Timothy. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 17. And what happened there? It was he spent only three Sabbaths, so which, make, which gives us the impression that he was probably, they were probably in Thessalonica for only three weeks or about there, and then the church was established. But during that time in the establishment of the church, there were, the Jews became extremely violent because there were many Greeks who had converted to Christ. And the Bible tells us that after that they had to escape Paul and uh, his colleagues they had to leave and go to another city called Berea where there were nobler Jews who investigated the scriptures for themselves. Now, my message today is going to be centered, although I will be talking about all the other verses, but I just want to reread verses 9 and 10 because they are very critical to our understanding of the fruit that flows out of repentance. Listen. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath of God. That, that verse really in many ways does describe what happens at the time of repentance. But when we think about repentance, we also need to be reminded of something else that's very critical that makes repentance possible and forgiveness are accessible. And that is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not repentance simply because I'm talking to God. It is only possible because of the cross of Jesus. The blood that he shed made possible the forgiveness of God for us. And so we understand from what, is, what Paul says here, authentic repentance results in life transformation. And if you read through the scriptures, every touch on the word repent, repentance, even when you go back to Matthew chapter 3 and you look at John's preaching, you get to understand that as he preached and he was calling people to repent and come to the kingdom, he also had a very clear message that the people that repent must go back and be a different people. So repentance has to do with the turning around. May I say, you know, as someone who grew up and who got saved and have fellowshiped with the East African Revival brethren, I find a lot of defeat by sin among Christians currently. And it's not like the big, big things. You know, many of us just look at maybe theft or sexual immorality. Those also happen. But I can tell you that I find people defeated in their lives by little things like anger, bitterness, tribalism or racism. And some of these actually manifest themselves very differently. The tribalism may just manifest itself by you not wanting to sit with someone. Or just a comment you make to someone else 
that belittles people from another tribe or from another race. Gossip. My predecessor, Professor Noel, used to say that this place, information travels by rumors and gossip and slander. That is sin. And we need to name it as sin. When you start gossiping, when you start slandering, when you tarnish another person's name about things you don't even have evidence, that is sin. And many of us continue through life completely defeated by those things. Or lust. Being lustful. You know, lust is one of those things that is within. And so other people will not even see it. They will not know that you are actually defeated, but when you lie on your bed or wherever you are, your mind is filled with lust. And you just think that's normal. After all, you can stand and praise the Lord and you can say, I got saved, and you have a date when you came to Christ. That is sin. When we talk about repentance, we are talking about sin. A spirit of criticism. I see that only too often. That quite often, and I'm not talking about unbelievers, friends. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about us believers. That we love looking at other people and we seem to see the wrong things that they do and to talk about the wrong things that they do more than we talk about the fact that they are created in the image of God. To love them. Or pride. Pride. I think this is the sin of preachers in this day and age. Look at most of our preachers, most of our pastors. They may mention Jesus, but actually they are preaching themselves, aren't they? They are. So Jesus just comes in to validate the fact that they are a Christian church. But the reality is they are showing themselves off. I've been in churches, and my wife also can give testimony to this, where someone is just talking about how they are dressed. And they think, and so what they do is then they say, do you see how Jesus has made me smart? So that you start thinking that actually they are talking about Jesus. They are talking about themselves. And it can even be in ministry. God can use you for mir to perform miracles, but those miracles then puff you up. And so you call people to come and you pray for them, but actually you're not calling them to Jesus, you're calling them to yourself. Sin. You see, if we talk about repentance, we must understand the seriousness of the problem of sin. Sin. Now, like I said, they have, repentance is a 180 degree turn. They turned from idols to serve the living God. What is that? You're walking, going this way, and what repentance does is you completely turn and you have your back against the sin. That's what repentance is all about. Very simply. But I want to put before you that there are three dimensions of repentance and I'll just say it very quickly. The first one is intellectual. For you to know what is wrong. Because quite often we move with the things that we think are right and we just keep on moving and moving and moving and we don't stop to know what is wrong. The Bible is invaluable in helping us to understand what is wrong. God has made it clear. We must know that. A change in understanding. But secondly, the emotional. The Bible often talks about remorse, but remorse alone is not enough. Remember the case of Judas Iscariot? He was remorseful. And he went and wept. But his repentance, that was not repentance. To be remorseful, to be sorrowful, to feel grief about the wrong that you have done is not in itself repentance. We may preach and people come and they have tears in their eyes. 
that does not necessarily, it may be, but does not necessarily mean they have repented. I've been preaching for long enough to know there are many who come with the tears and go back smiling into their sin. Remorse is important. Judas had remorse. It's indeed a dimension of repentance. But we must not mistake the tears for repentance. Someone might just be having a moment of feeling bad. <laughs> You're just feeling bad. You touched on something that really, I just feel, it reminded me something. But not necessarily that the person is changing. But the third and it's a very important part of the dimension is the deeds, the behavior, the conduct. Repentance is incomplete until a life is turned around. I taught at Makere University until 1987. From 1988 up to this time, you count your years, I've been working in Christian institutions. And it's interesting. I think quite often I have felt I've had more trouble with Christians than I used to have with Makere people. And probably they've had a lot of trouble with me too anyway. But it happens. And by the way, I'm not saying something I've not heard other Christians say. A Christian community is, does not sanitize you. Okay? Does not. From wrongdoing. Behavior. Genuine repentance cannot leave the sinner wallowing in sin. Unless you don't understand the seriousness of the problem of sin, it's because of sin that Jesus came to the cross. And that's why I made mention of the cross. A life of sin forsaken is evidence of effective repentance and salvation appropriated or secured. But now turning to Paul, let me just read for you verse 3. But I think that's where he starts now talking about the fruit of repentance. Listen to what he says in verse 3. Let me start from verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Three things he mentions. And by the way, you hear Paul talk about these again and again in a number of other texts. I could give you Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. He mentions it, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where he talks about faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I'm sure you know that one. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, verse 5 to 6. He keeps on talking about faith, hope, love. Those three must be evident in a life that has repented. So Paul says, I remember before our God and Father, your work of faith. First and foremost, your work of faith. The work of faith. In other words, what Paul is saying is that genuine, genuine repentance shows itself in our works. If your works are not exhibiting the God in whom you claim to believe, we must question ourselves whether you are truly converted, whether you have truly repented. Faith works. You know, many times we talk about faith, not works. We are saved by faith, not works. But we forget to complete that sentence, and I like completing it this way. Faith, we are saved by faith, not works, but faith that works. Are you with me? And I think that's the point that actually the writer of the Hebrews is making in chapter 11. He's saying that these people who had faith, that faith worked. Now Paul is very interesting. 
Because in verse 8, listen to what he says. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. How did it go? You ask yourself. Did it go by people sitting and reading their Bibles and praying and keeping them to themselves? And he says the same thing in Romans chapter 1 verse 8. Your faith is proclaimed. What did they see? They saw works. That faith transformed them. When you repent and you turn to Christ, it must be shown that faith must be shown in the works. He often talks about the obedience of faith. The, ob the obedience of faith. So I would ask, do you work out of fear? Or for gain? Especially for those of us who are employees or out of duty? Or because faith propels you to work? It's faith that must be visible. Secondly, he says, the, the unwavering hope. That is that steadfast hope. Genuine repentance pours into our hearts assurance of God's forgiveness and God's salvation. Friends, when I came to Christ in 1976, I have already said this, the one thing that was immediately experienced in my own life by turning to Christ was that sense of assurance. I know where I am going. When you repent and you turn to Christ, he fills your heart with hope. He helps us to understand that, look, we are not living just for a moment, but God has a future for us. And in Romans chapter 5, he actually talks about it. That the faith that we have, when it has fully matured, it matures into a hope that does not disappoint us. You hear that? Does not disappoint us. That the Jesus that I believed is a Jesus that shall never leave me. That when he promised that he will take me to the Father, I shall indeed see the Father one day. Hope. Steadfast, unwavering. I see many Christians. You know, they are never sure. You know, one of the statements I don't like is at the funerals when people say, may his soul rest in peace. I don't like that statement. If someone is an unbeliever and they have died an unbeliever, what peace are you talking about? If someone believed, even at the last moment, then he's already at peace. So why are you telling him that may he so rest in peace? Right? Do you tell me may you become the vice chancellor when I'm already the vice chancellor? <laughs> idle words. Idle words. I see nowhere in the scriptures to justify those statements. Nowhere. On the contrary, I hear the writer of the Hebrews say, it's appointed for men to die once and after that comes judgment. It cannot be changed by the words that we say after someone has died. He said of Alexander the Great, when he was going out on his campaigns, he decided to give away all his personal property to his friends. He gave away, he distributed everything. And people wondered, why are you doing that? Why are you giving away everything? I mean, it's like you're a lunatic or something. You know his answer? He said, I have kept my hopes. When you have hope, you can step out into the unknown because you know Jesus is with you. The third one he talks about is the labor of love. As a fruit of turning to Christ. Of that repentance. Genuine repentance embraces all people and labors for the good of all. Embraces all people. Friends, how I wish that as Christians, 
we would love each other in the way that it was said of the early church. That they loved each other even before they knew each other. Right? They loved each other. The moment they met, they loved each other. They didn't know what the other person is like. They didn't know how good or bad that person is. They did not know what their tribe was. They did not care. They loved each other. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. And what does he say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Where there is no love, it can't be known. The labor of love is a fruit of repentance. Love. You know, it is possible to labor and labor, but it's a loveless labor. But what Paul is saying to us is, no, 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 no. When you have love, you labor with love. <laughs> you should have seen me when I was coming back from Australia. And I was coming back and I knew that I had a wedding. I had to marry my wife. Well, then she was a fiancé. Hey. <laughs> I had, you know, because I was going to marry, I had not been here. I had no property. I had nothing. So I wanted to buy everything. Everything. Because I loved this girl. Let me tell you something. They weighed my carry-on, what I thought was my carry-on, and it was over 30 kilograms. The problem is they didn't wear my, my jacket. Because actually I had packed everything. These people who have been out, they know what I mean. And those were difficult days. I was coming back 1984. The jacket was full. I knew in Uganda I wouldn't get more of these things. So the jacket was full of things. If they had weighed it, it would have been like 10 kilograms or even 20. <laughs> and I'm serious. Because I could feel it. The lady, we weigh, they weighed, you know, in those days it was only one bag checked in. They checked in that one, it was over 40 kilograms. He said, where is your carry-on? They brought the carry-on. I was in trouble. Why was I doing that? I was coming back because I loved someone and I wanted to marry her. The labor of love. Are you with me? When you love someone, you will go to a great extent. <laughs> that amen is right. Okay, time is against me. I'm just going to say the last few comments and then uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize the last. But I, I don't want you to forget the fruit of repentance is summarized for us in the works of faith, steadfast hope, and the labor of love. But now let's see. What else happened with the Thessalonians? Paul summarizes this for us. And I'm just going to say four things. The first one, he says, as a fruit of repentance, they followed the godly example of the preachers. The godly example. I pity many of you, actually, the young people, and I've talked to many, and many young people say they have no role models that they can look up to, and I understand. We have failed you. That's true. We have failed you. And for those of us, our generation, we, do, we need to just repent to the young people. Because you should be having an example in us of what godliness is all about. I had an example. I had men and women of the East African revival who were an example for me. But instead, what are we seeing? Someone says I'm saved, but there's absolutely no evidence for you to follow in their life. These Thessalonians had an example in Paul and his colleagues. In their repentance, they esteemed the godly life, the righteousness, the holiness that they saw as being most important. But secondly, 
As we read before in verses 9 and 10, they converted holy from idols to God. For you it may not be idols in a shrine. But I think we need to attack the principle that was very clear in their life. That for them, idols were completely out. God was completely in. They changed loyalty. The things that they considered to be so important, indispensable, essential, even quintessential to their own life. They said that is no more. When they repent and they turn from idols, they completely follow God. Their loyalty is to another. A new master is in charge. That's repentance. We change our master and we change our values. But thirdly, the joy in the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of repentance. You see, when Jesus takes sin away from your heart, you feel lighter. And I have known this again and again. First time I knew it was when I came to Christ. And all of a sudden, I walked around. I remember particularly in the morning, I walked around because I came to Christ at night. In the morning, I'm walking out and my heart feels lighter. Why? Because I had turned to Christ. That's how it should be. The joy of the Holy Spirit. And you know the interesting thing in this case for the Thessalonians in verse 6? He says, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. Those Thessalonians were rough. When they couldn't find Paul, they went for the, his host, Jason. And they took Jason. I don't know how they did it. He probably, like we say in Luganda, the legs were not touching the ground. Shoot! They were violent people. But in the midst of that affliction, what, did, what was visible in their life because of their repentance? Joy in the Holy Spirit. That the joy that God gives is joy that goes beyond. When I was in South Africa recently, I met up with a man. He used to be actually our leader, international team leader, Michael Cassidy. Struggling with the cancer. And actually, we went for the meeting in South Africa specifically. We could have met in, in any other country, but we wanted to go there and be able to meet with Michael because we've not seen him in about three years. Now, on the day that we planned to go and see him, we were informed he had to go for chemotherapy because he has cancer, leukemia, and he has got some other complications. So here we are, they drive us now, eventually when he came out of the, the chemotherapy, they drove us to his house and were wondering what kind of man are we going to see? Do you know what we saw? The joy of the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Holy Spirit. We had actually said we will only spend not more than 30 minutes. He said, no, 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 no. I want to be with you longer. And he looked great. The joy of the Holy Spirit comes with repentance. But finally, in verse 13, is also the way we look at God's word. Chapter 3, verse 13. We didn't read that, but I think it's important for us to look at it very quickly. And I'll just mention it. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. It was not just the preacher's word, it was God's word. One of the things that has destroyed many of the churches internationally is when people start looking at God's word as if it's man's word. And then they are able to decide what should be in and what should be out. May God have mercy on us. Friends, repentance. Let me end with a little story. Because repentance has to do with sin. I was told a story of an animal in Greenland that uh, the people there like eating. But you know, Greenland is of course mostly ice, isn't it? 
But these people there, the Eskimos, they know exactly how to get it. They do have these knives that they sharpen very, very well. Two edges. And after they've sharpened them, they put on them the blood that this animal likes to lick. And then they just put it there. And the animal comes and starts to leak. Like we love leaking sin. And it leaks. It leaks. But as it leaks, whatever was on there, whatever was tasty, is no longer there. Now the knife starts digging through its own tongue. And blood comes out. And as it leaks, it thinks it is still leaking the same blood. But you know what's happening? It's actually killing itself. That's how it is with the sin. Let us learn the importance of repentance. Or else, sin will kill us. May God bless you.